Thank you, Marcy. I'd like to take a long time up here. Having spent 45 minutes with Sister Melanie this morning before she was interviewed downtown, but I know I can't do that. So I will limit myself to maybe one uh, little story that she told me. Sister Melanie has been a member of the um, Notre Dame Sisters of Chardon for 59 years now. She looks pretty good, doesn't she? She has earned master's degrees from two places, Indiana University, a master's in English, and also a master's in spirituality from Duke Duquesne University. She has served as a high school and college teacher, novice director, spiritual director, and congregational leader. Currently, she gives talks like she's going to give today and also retreats nationally. As a freelance writer, Sister Melanie has written for America Magazine, The Catholic Digest, National Catholic Reporter, Living Faith, Living with Christ, Give Us This Day, and Country Woman. Now, which one of those would you wonder about? <laughs> I said to her, I have to ask you something. And she said, yeah, country woman, right? I said, yeah, I do. Uh, so here's what she said. She wrote an article about goose feather quilts or comforters. And she said, well, I, I grew up on a small farm. And we had geese. And I guess you had goose feather comforters, which were so comfy and so soft. So anyway, um, was that like a long time ago? <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so if we wanted to go back to uh, investigate uh, issues of country woman, we have to put your name in and then maybe we could find your article, huh? Anyway. Um, some of the books that Sister has displayed up here are Hanging on to Hope, one book that I can personally recommend. Also, When the Rain Speaks, Picking Strawberries, Traits of a Healthy Spirituality, and a few more. So we encourage you to take a look up there later if you have some time. Otherwise, join me in welcoming Sister Melanie Svoboda. Thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate that. I have been asked to tell you to please silence your cell phones. That came from the top. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here and to speak with you today. And even though I know some of you, very few of you personally, I know this about all of you, that for all of you, your faith must be important to you. Why else would you come to a thing like this except for a wonderful dinner, luncheon, that was great. You might have even said, if, if the nun's not good, we'll at least get a good lunch. <laughs> But you're here because you are people of faith. And when we're people of faith, we're always looking for encouragement, for direction, and probably somewhere in your thinking is, well, maybe, maybe she will inspire me with one thought and I can take that home with me. And so that's my goal today. <clears throat> I want to thank Sister Nancy also for inviting me. She was my contact person. And I want to thank Ray Novotny. He was my Uber driver today, taking me down to, uh, into Youngstown for that interview. I really appreciate that. I taught college and high school for over 20 years. Old teachers never die. <laughs> so I'm going to begin with a quiz. Now, some of you are thinking, I didn't come here to answer questions. But I'm going to make it easy. There's only three questions, and you can cheat 
you can ask anybody who's close to you what the correct answer is, okay? So I'm sure we're going to get some correct answers. Here are my three que questions. They are all about Mary. Question number one, what was Ma Mary's real name? By that I mean, what did her mom and dad call her? What did her friends call her? Oh, I already see people talking. Okay, the second question, did Mary wear blue? <laughs> did Mary wear blue? Lovely lady dressed in blue, teach me how to pray. Okay, that's the poem. Number three, was Mary ever on the cover of National Geographic? <laughs> Okay, take just a few seconds. What was Mary's real name? Did she wear blue? Was she ever on the cover of National Geographic? Anybody at your table know any of those? Okay, do, 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 do. Okay, time's up, time's up. What was Mary's real name? Miriam. Miriam, my table, my table, A plus table there. Miriam, which is Hebrew for Mary. So Miriam would have been what she was called and her, what her friends, M-I-R-I-A-M or M-Y-R-I-A-M. Did Mary ever wear blue? No, why not? <laughs> I don't know why she didn't wear blue. Ray. Okay, he knows his, his dyes. Yes, yes. Blue would have been a very expensive dye. It was usually used by the very wealthy or the royalty or purple or any of those colors. So instead of Mary wearing blue because she was of humble means, she probably would have had undyed clothing, more this color. So I ran off the two handouts to show you so you could remember wh probably what color <laughs> Mary wore. And number three, was she ever on the cover of National Geographic? Yes, and here's the cover. December 2015, I will leave it out here, you can look at it. And this is what the title of the article was, The Most Powerful Woman in the World, Mary. So I'm telling you, Mary is a great woman. Okay, so let's begin. If you have the blue sheet out, you'll see the title of my talk, Mary, Woman of Hope and One of Us, and if you notice, the first 10 points, that's where I'll concentrate. We're going to look at scripture and a little bit of history and tradition thrown in to see how Mary was a woman of hope and how she was one of us. I'd like to begin with a story that is told by Kathleen Norris. She's a poet and a writer, probably best known for two of her books, Dakota, which became a bestseller, and The Cloister Walk, which also was a bestseller. She's a Benedictine oblate. She was giving a talk in an elementary school, middle-aged kids, I mean middle school kids, and um, she told them that she would like them to draw a picture of Mary. So she passed out the paper and the colored markers, <coughs> and one of the girls raised her hand and said, why hasn't anyone drawn Mary like a real woman? And she said, well, now's your chance. Go ahead, you've got your paper. So they're all working drawing Mary. And she went back to the girl who had just finished her drawing and she looked at what the girl had drawn. And there was Mary wearing yoga pants, <laughs> bright blue yoga pants, and she had a red top on, and on the front of the top was a bird. It was the Holy Spirit in white. But it wasn't a serene and calm bird. 
This was a wild bird. The wings were flapping. She got it so it looked like the wings were flapping. The legs were sticking straight out. And Kathleen Norris said, when I looked at that picture, I thought the girl had drawn Mary as a woman ready for anything. And she said, that is a good description of Mary, the woman ready for anything. So if we look at the blue sheet, we're going to just look at that annunciation. Annunciation. What was that like? Well, we don't know. I've seen paintings where they have Gabriel as this white angel, but I've also seen paintings of the Annunciation where they just have a beam of white light. Who knows what the experience was like. But we are told that it occurred in Nazareth of Galilee. Why is that important? Because it's a real place. It's a real place. So Mary lived in a real place. She lived in a real time, first century Palestine that was being controlled by the mighty Roman Empire, one of the biggest empires in history. We know she was probably about 12 or 13 years old because there was no such thing as teenagers until the 20th century. Did you realize that? There was no such thing as teenagers. You went from a child and then very quickly you became an adult. And that was Mary's situation. We find out that she was engaged to a man named Joseph. So Mary was in a real time, a real place, and she had made real plans. Doesn't that sound like us here in Youngstown or wherever we are. I, I, are we in Youngstown right now? I, Youngstown Diocese, we'll say that. And we're in the 21st century, United States. Secondly, what is Mary's reaction when Gabriel begins to talk to her? I love the translation. She was greatly troubled by what he said. Another translation, she was deeply disturbed. We can't just go over those words. That tells us something about Mary. She didn't know what was going on. We know, 2,000 years later, she didn't know what was going on. So any time in our lives when we are greatly troubled or deeply disturbed, we have to say, guess what? Mary would understand that. She experienced that. And then it says that she pondered what was said to her. So Mary was a very reflective woman. She just didn't live life. She reflected on her life. And many of us do that probably on a daily basis where we want to reflect on not what happened, but I want to know what might this mean or how did I feel when it happened? Or what does this circumstance calling me to do? So Mary did that too. Then that same sentence or a couple sentences later tells us she questioned. She questioned. And sometimes people think if I'm questioning things, it means I'm losing my faith. If I have doubts, I'm losing my faith rather than saying that the questions and the doubts are a call to deepen your faith, to broaden your faith. And that's what Mary was doing, to question how is this going to come about, probably saying, is Joseph going to be the father, because they were formally engaged. Her question is answered, and then we have that beautiful yes, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to your word. And when I read those words, I am transported to Gethsemane and Jesus, which we just read th this past week. Jesus' agony in the garden. 
where he says to Abba, to Father, anything but this, God, anything but this horrific way to die. The Romans had perfected crucifixion. It was one of the main ways they kept that mighty empire under control. And Jesus in Gethsemane says what his mother says in the Annunciation, basically, your will be done. He learned a lot from his mother and his father, especially about praying to God. Then the first thing Mary does, we are told, oh, wait a minute, one more sentence. The last sentence of the Annunciation says, and the angel left her. I think that sentence is really important. If I were Mary, I would say, hey, Gabe, get back here. Now you can't leave me now. Now I need you more than ever to tell me what in the world I'm supposed to do. How do you raise a Messiah? No, the angel left her. And I think that's a clear indication that Mary was like us. She didn't have an angel by her side who was whispering in her ear to tell her what to do. She had only what we have. She had her own personal loving relationship with God, trusting in God, and one day at a time. And that's what we have, another way she's like us. Mary visits in haste Elizabeth. She sings her glorious Magnificat, which is a story about God is turning the world upside down, and isn't it wonderful? <laughs> Most of us would say, no, I don't want the world upside down. I want it the way it is because I'm comfortable with this. But sometimes God comes into our lives and flips our world upside down. Her beautiful Magnificat also makes it very clear that God is on the side of the poor that God is in the midst of our world, but if you want a really good place to find God, yes, God is everywhere, but you'll meet him very specially in the poor and when you acknowledge your own poverty. Joseph has a dilemma. When Mary comes back, she's gone three months. When she comes back, the rumors begin to start. You know how it is. Nazareth is a small town. She looks pregnant, you know? Well, okay, but Mary and Joseph have this betrothal that they are, it's as strong as a marriage bond, and so most people would have assumed that Joseph was the father. Some of his buddies might have said, hey, Joe, you jumped the gun, didn't you? But we could see why. She's such a beautiful woman. We could see why. And Joseph, Joseph is in agony because he knows he's not the father of that child. So he turns to God, he turns to his faith. His Jewish faith gives him two options, divorce her or have her stoned to death for infidelity. And he's tossing and turning at night. We've all had those, haven't we? Tossing and turning at night. And then he has his own enunciation the angel, some angel, comes in and tells him, Joe, there's a third option. Marry her and raise the boy as your own. And Joseph, with tremendous faith, accepts the third option. What can we say about the birth in Bethlehem? I put on my sheet that it's an example of Mary being at the mercy of political powers beyond her control. We all have some powers that are beyond our control. If you watch the news at night, night in the evening or go online, if you're anything like me, sometimes I just find myself just in agony over what I am seeing. And this world, it does seem beyond our control. Well, Mary must have known that. Caesar, the arrogant man that he was, realized that he was being cheated out of tax money. 
Some of his tax collectors were saying, two for Caesar, one for me, two for Caesar, one for me. And he knew it. So he wanted a census to find out how many people are in my kingdom so I get my money. And he had no thought about what this would do, how inconvenient it might be for some people. And Mary, nine months pregnant, tries to get up on a donkey. Now, I've never been pregnant, I assure you, but many of you here have been pregnant. Imagine at nine months trying to get up on a donkey and traveling 100 miles because the law said you had to go back to Bethlehem. <clears throat> and so Mary and Joseph do that, and we know the beautiful, beautiful story of that first Christmas. It warms our heart every time we hear that story. But we know the calm didn't last very long. We know the story of Herod, another very arrogant leader, and the Magi, and we know that Joseph has to take the Holy Family, Mary and Jesus, and, Jesus and flee into Egypt, a foreign land. I read something the other day about refugees. And it said the 21st century is going to go down in history as the century of refugees. If we think it's bad now, wait and wait. More people are going to be uh, thrown out or fleeing from wherever they are because of war, because of violence, because of famine because of flooding, Bangladesh, will we even have a country like Bangladesh if the water keeps rising, how much land they've already lost. And so again, when we look at Jesus and Mary and Joseph and we realize they experienced what it was like to live in a foreign land, probably dress a little funny, you know, many times you could tell foreigners because they don't dress like the rest of us dress, and they don't know the language, and they speak with an accent. Anytime I hear somebody speaking with an accent, I want to bow down before them, because that means they know at least two languages fluently. And how many, how fluent am I in any language, you know? Anyway, <clears throat> Jesus' public ministry begins with Cana. Oh, wait a minute. Number six. See, this is why I do the outline, so I remember <laughs> what I'm supposed to be talking about. Jesus, the finding in the temple. What a beautiful story for parents, I think. It's also a beautiful story for anybody who has lost anyone for any amount of time. So on their way back, They've been in Jerusalem. It's like going to New York City, this huge city, and they're going back to Podunk. And on the way there, after three days, they realize Jesus is not with him. Mary saying, Joe, I thought you had him. Well, I thought you had him. I mean, you know, that might have caused quite a ruckus between the two of them. Anyway, they go back to Jerusalem in fear and terror of a 12-year-old boy being lost alone in a big city, 12 years old. Human trafficking was uh, well alive even in first century, I assure you. And that would have probably been one of their first thoughts, who's going to take him and for what? But they find Jesus in the temple and one of my favorite paintings is of Mary scolding Jesus <laughs> in the temple. You know, that's the human reaction. My goodness, she probably gave him a real big hug and then probably pushed him away and said, why did you do this? Your father and I have been in agony. And a learning experience for Jesus. Wow, I didn't realize how much they loved me. Look at what, how, you know, what did I cause? And I did, I have to be more careful. I got to let them know where I am, you know, whatever it is. 
then the public ministry. Jesus begins it, at least in one of the Gospels, at the wedding feast of Cana. What I love about this story is Mary's sensitivity. It seems she's the only one who realized that the wine was running out. It doesn't say that the stewards came and told her the wine or the father of the bride told her that the wine was run. She detected it. And she goes to Jesus, and maybe she didn't even know why she went there, but maybe he could do something. Who knows? Anyway, she just tells them. I love that. She didn't say, could you please make more wine? She just says, they have no wine. And I think that is one of the best prayers we can ever pray, is to say to God what we've noticed. So we're not specifically asking God, you do what I think you should do. No, I'm just going to raise this situation up to you. I'm going to raise this person up to you and just say, she needs your help or they need your help. What a beautiful prayer. And then she says to the stewards, do whatever he tells you. Jesus' miracle at Cana shows Mary's sensitivity. And again, I say, Jesus, so sensitive himself. Remember the touch, the woman who touched the tassel on his garment? Wasn't even touching him, just part of his clothes. Who touched me? Where did he get such sensitivity again, except from his dear mother? Then Jesus' arrest, trial, crucifixion, and death. What does that tell us? We all experience many deaths in our life. And the older we get, when we've been around the sun 79 times, I assure you I have experienced many deaths. And sometimes I say, I can't take any more. I can't take any more. Mary experienced the death of her son, her 33-year-old son. And he was condemned unjustly. First of all, this beautiful man, unjustly condemned, and then to meet such a terrible, terrible death. And she stood with him. Talk about helplessness. She was with her son at the foot of the cross. So whatever we are experiencing, especially when we feel helpless against the, the, the suffering of our loved ones, Mary was there. Mary understands. Recently, we just read the description of the women going to the tomb to anoint the dead body of Jesus. And of course, what strikes many of us is the fact that his mother wasn't with them. Well, why not? It's easy, again, to speculate. Did she somehow get his message that his death wasn't final? Or on that early morning had Jesus already appeared to her. But she is not with them when they anoint the corpse. And then finally, the last time Mary is shown in uh, the New Testament, she is with the group in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. She's praying with them, scripture tells us. What a comfort and support she must have meant to that early Christian community just to have the mother of Jesus in our presence. And how lucky we are that in our faith we show Mary such a hallowed place in our Catholic tradition to have her in our midst. At the end of that sheet, I have um, a summary. Mary
Mary was a real woman living in a real time and in a real place just as we are. I already talked about the angel who parted from her, reminding us that she had only her love and trust in God and one day at a time, and that's all we're given. Mary experienced times of joy, times of pain, times of struggle. Mary spoke with God every single day as we try to do. She was a woman of hope, and I just want to say something about hope. If you want to know about hope, you can buy one of my books. But anyway, <laughs> my definition of hope is the belief that a better world is possible. A belief that the better world is possible. And it's rooted in the promises of Jesus. I am with you always. He didn't say, I am with you until COVID comes. Then I'm leaving, as some preachers were trying to tell us. God just left us. This is the scourge of humanity for all of our sins. You know, you heard things like that. No, God is with us, even in something as awful as that was. The kingdom of God is among you, among us. The kingdom of God is in this room, uh, among us. And Jesus wants to bring about the greater fullness. And when we have hope, the poet uh, Puyi, the French poet, has a beautiful poem about hope. And he says, there are three sisters, faith, hope, and charity. And we spend so much time talking about faith and charity or love that we forget little hope. And he says that hope is the smallest of the three sisters, but she's in the middle and she's holding on to faith and she's holding on to uh, love. And she is leading them into the future. So hope is the virtue that leads our love and leads our faith into the future. Without faith, without hope, if we don't believe a better world is possible, then why do anything, you know? Why do anything? So it's a beautiful way of looking at hope. And I want to call your attention to the last quote on the other side of that sheet, the blue sheet. There's a lot of quotes. You can read all those. A little boy was asked what the resurrection means. He said it means Jesus is on the loose. <laughs> he saw that empty tomb, you know, with the roll, stone rolled back. Jesus is on the loose. I think it's the best definition of the resurrection. So look for Jesus in your everyday. Jesus is on the loose. And don't forget, when you look in the mirror, Jesus is an Andalus in here, too, you know. Get in touch with the Jesus in yourself. Okay, I'm going to conclude this part with a Hail Mary because we can all say that together. And what a beautiful prayer that is. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Okay, anything else? Do you have any questions? I guess that's what I'm supposed to ask. I could have a couple for you if nobody asks any. Or any comments. doesn't even have to be a question. It can be a comment, too. Anybody. Do, 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 do. I'll give you a few seconds. Do, 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 do. Yes, a hand. Marcy, well, she's, I mean, we know her position. And here's a microphone, that's even better. Because nobody can hear me without one. So I want to go back to your, your statement here uh, on number nine. Um, is Mary the first one to see him? Where, have you seen that anywhere? Have you read that anywhere? I'm just curious as to where no. it's your own. I mean, I, the I, question has been raised. I don't think there's any definitive thing that, but it, I guess the more you know Jesus, I mean, look what he did at Cana. 
So is he going to see other people before he sees his mother? I don't know. So the answer is I don't know. Yes, oh wait, maybe somebody knows. Okay, oh. <laughs> Uh, Sister, I don't know if you're familiar. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes. I don't know if you're familiar with the series, The Chosen. Yes. Are you familiar yes. with the authors, the way they put, the way they explain that Blessed Mother, Ima, how she knew, she was a good friend of the mother of the groom. So she helped with all the preparations. That's right. Their version of it is the wedding feast. So, I mean, the Cana. And Mary had an active part in that. Yes. That's true. Okay, just wanted to mention. Yeah, okay, that's and all. I personally love The Chosen. And I know when it first started, you know, I told myself, you're not going to like this. You don't like the different versions of Jesus. You know, it's very hard for them to find somebody that can sell me on the person of Jesus. Because so often in some of the older films, Jesus walks like a robot. Bless you, my child. You know, and this Jesus is real. This Jesus laughs. This Jesus teases. This Jesus is teased. Uh, it, it, it has done, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, I thought, was just magnificent. And I love it. Another scene with his mother. I haven't seen all of them, by the way. But another scene with his mother is when he has been standing all day, cheering people or talking to people. And he comes back, and he's so sore, and his mother massages him. I just think that's beautiful. Okay, thank you for bringing that up. Actually, I thought my husband was going to tell this other story. Okay, tell the story. Tell us. I'm going to tell you instead. It's actually, uh, well, at Cana. We're back at Cana. And, you know, when she says they have no wine, and so she said, well, then you say, do whatever he tells you. Well, then I read into the Tribune and say, didn't Jesus say, woman, my hour has not yet come? And and I think that's what comes next. And Dean just said, that's because Mary's not going to take no for an answer. So she just <laughs> do whatever he says. <laughs> yeah, they do humanize the, because we don't have the exact dialogue in scripture. You know, nobody was sitting there. Uh, say, repeat that again, Jesus. I want to make sure I get it down because the Gospels were written so far, so long after the resurrection. But they, they bring in the human. I like when he calls Matthew. And of course, Simon says, do you know who it is? You know, Simon, you're not going to call him to be my disciple. He's a tax collector. Yep. And then Jesus says, get used to different that's the phrase. I got my friend a t-shirt that says that. Get used to different. If you're going to hang around with Jesus, you better learn that sometimes Jesus thinks very differently from us. And then they're walking in, and, some, and Jesus tells uh, Matthew, we're going to have a, a nice dinner tonight. And Matthew says, where? And Jesus says, at your house. <laughs> See, that humanizes, that humanizes. Anything else? Yes. Oh, okay. Here, I can read the book. Maybe I can read it. You're going to get your exercise today. <laughs> I could have gotten this. Did I understand you correctly at the beginning? You said uh, Mary was in Nazareth, in Nazareth of Galilee, in Palestine. Yes. Palestine and Israel the same place? Was she Palestinian? It, during her day, it was Palestine, and Nazareth would be one of the towns. But she was still Jewish. Oh, yes. Well, she, what, today, yes, yes Jewish. Oh, sure. Well, if you look what happened after 1948, you know, but isn't it the truth? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I read the Psalms, you know, and every time I heard the word Israel, you know, I was going, please be with Israel and with and Palestine, the Palestinians. It just wrenches my heart. Thank you. Okay. 
I have to talk about the power of the Hail Mary. Okay. I, as a Catholic woman, feel sorry for uh, women of other faiths. I respect their differences, but I don't know how they get through childbirth, death of a child, hardships that come along when the husband loses his job. What do they say? How? What is their own recourse? I find the Hail Mary has brought me through many, many hard times, and I say, hooray. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, we have to we have to value our own tradition, you know, and see the good in our own tradition. But more and more Protestant things that in churches, like especially the Lutherans, one of my favorite books on Mary, which title I can't remember, by it was by Thomas Kuhn, but it was about Mary, and he's Lutheran, and it was about reclaiming her. But they thought we worshipped her, see. That was part of the misunderstanding. Catholics worship Mary. We worship Jesus to the Father through Jesus. So he tried to clarify that, <clears throat> but I agree. <clears throat> thank you for that. Sister, I would just like to thank you. I think you touched our hearts, and you shined a beacon on Mary today and reminded us how special she is to all of us. Thank you, thank Sister. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the other sheet I gave you are just a couple excerpts from uh, two of my books. And the first, I was born and raised on that small farm. And so I look at the image of God <clears throat> through the lens of a little girl who is riding the tractor with her father for the very first time. And that little girl was me, of course. And how that became an image for me years later of God, of God's love for us. And the other is a poem, and it's called What If? And if you look at the fourth stanza, what if Mary had said, sorry, Gabe, but tell God I've already made other plans? <laughs> See, we, we always make plans. And sometimes God comes and interrupts our plans. And I gave you another quote on that sheet. The Hasidic Jews have this wonderful quote, and it says, God is not a nice uncle. God is an earthquake. So if we think, as long as I pray and be good, God will be a nice uncle for me, we forget that God is an earthquake at times in our life. Can we accept that? Okay, that's about enough, don't you think? Okay, thank you so much for being here. I enjoyed speaking to you.